Welcome once again. This is Women in Business. Smart24 TV, we're delighted to have you. The good thing about women in business is we get to talk about the journeys. The journeys of women. <laughs> we get to talk about the aspirations. We get to talk about their challenges, the opportunities. We get to talk about so many things, all talking about women in business. Today is such a great day. I'm delighted. I have my very special guest, Dr. Nolin Chirabo. Delighted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're very happy to have you. Now, for those of you who don't know, let me just make a very quick intro. Nolin, Dr. Nolin Chirabo, personal and business development coach and consultant, founder and uh, ED of uh, Chusa. Chusa has been there for quite a while and has done amazing things, continues to do so. Social entrepreneur, an author, TED speaker, certified mentor, trainer, and life coach. We have a hundred different titles, and they're all in you. On you, in you. <laughs> that is who you are, Nolin. Yes, that's true. I'm so delighted to have you on Women in Business. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here as well. Yes. Nolin, you've been doing so much. So much. You've been doing a lot of business mentorship. You have seen so many, many, many women and youth have actually gone through your fingers and you've done so much. Now, you're going to give us a lot, because this is not the first time, this is not going to be the second time, the third time, there are going to be so many other times when you are here mm -hmm. with us. And uh, we're delighted that you're part of us as well. Women in business needs as much insight because we're here to help women grow, to share our stories, but also to celebrate the journeys of women in business. Celebrating and talking about celebrating, we'd like to know what is your journey in business? How did you start? How were you inspired? I know you're a social entrepreneur. I know you're really mentoring so many. You have traveled to different countries to do so. You have been trained and you continue to pass on this training and this experience that you get. How did it start? <laughs> How did it start? Um, that's an interesting one. I think I'll start from the beginning. So... <clears throat> My journey, when I think about what I'm doing today, it goes as far as a little girl. I was raised by a single mother who was running a sole entrepreneurship business. My mother is, uh, in Uganda we call them tailors, yeah. but they're actually called seamstress. Because yes. she's professional, she went all the way to Nairobi, did her course. And so growing up, I saw my mom do her business, and that's how we uh, went through school. I'm the last one of three. And for me, uh, I looked at my mom and I could see the struggle she went through mm -hmm. and told myself I never want to do business. Mm -hmm. Because I'm thinking, I don't want to wake up early, I don't want to work late in the night. Mm -hmm. I want to just dress up because it seemed like white collar jobs were yeah, a sailing, were you know, kind of were thing. Easier. So I told myself, yeah, that's what I want to do. And uh, in school, I've always loved, I was very shy, but when it came to debating, I came alive. Mm -hmm. So I remember, I think I was in primary four when uh, one of my teachers told me, I think you'd make a great lawyer. And that sparked something in me because I realized, mm, mm. possibly I could be a voice, I could represent people, I could do something significant. Mm. And so I go through school and I was thinking I want to do journalism or law. Yeah. Unfortunately, when I finished my high school, I'd passed, I had 19 points, mm. but I couldn't go to the university. So I was admitted, but as a private student. Mm. And that was my first turning point in life. At no one time did your mom, you know, try to bring you into into that line of business like same stress no I so interestingly uh every time i had a conversation with my mom and she asked me where do you want to be and i said i want to be a lawyer i want to be a yeah. doctor I want to be all these things yeah. she also told me you can be anything you want to be she never she, drew she me never tried to push yeah you into her because i guess she wanted me to spread my wings and fly mm -hmm. so when i drop out at that point my dreams are basically tarnished and i'm thinking okay this is it what next what happens mm -hmm. And where I dropped out. <laughs> drop out. Drop out is not drop out. Drop out is having 19 points in a six, right? Yep. And not being able to be taken for government. Yes. Is that it? Yes. So when you said drop out. <laughs> oh, no. It's not is like it, I woke up it, and picked my bag. Yes, but, but, but <laughs> during that time, it felt, it felt like that. It, 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 it was like more of a, a disappointment, a setback, than a drop out. I didn't feel like I dropped out. Mm -hmm. I felt like the system had failed me. Because I really wanted to be in school. I desired this. to be there, yes. But then the system just wasn't working, you know, mm -hmm. for me at that time. So my mom, being a sole uh, breadwinner, at that time was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And being a mom, she had been quiet for some time. So by the time she comes to, to tell us, it's really advanced. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, we're talking about chemotherapy and at that time cancer equaled death so i knew my mother was going to die and i knew all my dreams were going to be tarnished so that was it that's, so that's six back. yes okay. so I, I literally was out for a couple of years and at that time um, i was into church i started volunteering just to keep myself busy keep myself active and then i discovered the national library the one on Boganda Road, and that became my favorite place. Mm -hmm. Because in there, I would go and read books, yes. and then I think it was in 2003, uh, so I finished my senior six in 2000, and then 2003 is the first time I get to touch a computer. Mm -hmm. And that was my second game changer. So when I get into the, I, I learn computer, then I get onto the internet. Yeah. So I'm searching all these things, I realize there's, there's so, so much, much knowledge, there's so, so much, much information. Mm -hmm. Now the shocker for me was, Free online courses. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. I'm here struggling with tuition and there's all yes. these courses I could do. Yeah. And then the interesting thing, there was nothing like minimum academic qualifications. Nothing. So it I could do open. any course at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to my peers and they're like, what's that? But, but, but I mean, like so many haven't really, they didn't take advantage of it then mm -hmm. and, and they still aren't. True. They still aren't. True. It's, Very true. And yet there are so many, there's actually one person who made, who made a comment and said you can actually become a surgeon <laughs> just, just you by getting You can. <laughs> oh, you could become so, a nurse or a doctor. You can <laughs> literally become anything you want to be just by getting onto online. Absolutely. So you were able to tap into that. And that was way back. Way yes, back. that was way back. It was a, quite a foreign concept. Um, so that's how I built my first CV. Then uh, it was in 2006 that I got my first job. And yeah, so when I got, uh, it was really like an entry job, an admin job. Mm -hmm. And then I started working from there. But for me, the resolution was the moment I started working, I was going to go back to school. So that's when I started going back. I took certificates, then diplomas, then I yes. kept upgrading. And there was no limit for me because I told myself, uh, it's not even a catch up. Mm -hmm. I embrace my journey as my path. Yeah. But that, just that lap of being out of school, I tried looking for jobs at that time. And it was interesting how people do want to know your name mm -hmm. or what credibility you had. They just wanted to know what papers you had. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, why are we judged by a single paper? Mm -hmm. But that's how the system works. Then. It's, I think it's, it still does. It's, it's, still, it's still there a little bit. It's yes. changed a little bit it, but it's to competence, yes. It's changing. But still, I think within the Ugandan culture, papers are still a big thing. They're overrated in many ways. True, true. But you'll also notice that right now, there's quite a lot of um, increased vocational skilling. True. And uh, you'll actually notice the majority. That's why at first they would uh, sort of like, you know, have your aptitude test and okay, mm -hmm. fine. You have the papers. That's all. Okay? you're hired but now <laughs> they they're going to take you through like a hundred different tests yes mm -hmm. there's the aptitude test then there's uh the, there's the different verbal then there's actually the immediate all mm. happening like in one day yes. in just a space of a couple of hours mm. so it still boils down to the skills and uh, of course the papers also work but if you do have the better skills the best man wins i agree right? so talking about skills so this is what happened the time I used to sit in the library, um, they only taught me Word and Excel. Beyond that point, I taught myself Publisher, Corel, Adobe, like I could do so wow. many things because I had that time anyway. Yes. So my first interview, they actually wanted some, the, the minimum qualification was bachelor's degree, which I didn't have. We didn't have. But I actually walk in, long story short, I walk into this office and I say I want to see the managing director. And this chick uh, was the admin, she tell, looks at me and says, do you have an appointment? And I'm like, um, kind of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, oh okay. Uh, he's just stepped out, but he's coming back. Yes. So I'm sitting at the reception, and this gentleman just comes and walks past. So the lady looks at me and says, do you know who you're waiting for? Yes. I said, uh, no, no. Treaty. <laughs> no, you don't say no. I said, no, Treaty. Mm. <laughs> so she goes in and tells the gentleman, there's a lady here. She's been waiting for you. And she says she has an appointment. The guy is like, mm, I don't have an appointment, but let her come in. Mm. So literally had come in to pick like documents. So I walk in, I literally stood, I didn't see it. Yeah. I went straight to the point, I introduced myself and this asked... This was 2000 what? Um, this was 2006. 2006. Yeah, so I asked, do you, have a, do you have job opportunities? And the guy is looking at me like, who told you? And how did you come in here? I, I can't explain it. Yes. It was one of those audacious moments, like... You just decide. I think sometimes when you go through a situation, mm -hmm. you get to a point where you say, enough is enough. What do I have to lose? Exactly. Like, I'd rather try. So for me, I'd come to a place where I was going to take an opportunity that comes my way. Mm -hmm. 
and so anyway so I, this guy looks at me and says yeah we have opportunities coming up but that's strange because we haven't publicized it yeah. but i like your courage and audacity what made you get to this particular place and not any other place this particular place that you went to and not necessarily any other place honestly speaking it was intuition intubation intuition intuition yeah so i'm just passing by and i'm like why not? Yeah. What do you have to lose? Whatever. So I just walked in. Yes. <laughs> so you didn't know these people? I didn't. And, and I've always passed there. I'd never seen the signpost. I'd never seen the office. But that particular day, it struck me. I said, well, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Mm. And uh, yeah, so anyway, long story short, I typed my CV. Uh, the gentleman shortlists me because, just because of that act of audacity. Like, man, it's not a common thing that Confidence. someone just walks in. Confidence. So I go in and I do this interview. People have the papers mm -hmm. and the interview was very practical. And I remember one of the things where I beat all of them was the computer skills. Uh, which were really, literally <laughs> self-taught. <laughs> Thank you. Self-taught. <laughs> That's the woman in business. Yes? Yeah. The woman in business, in most cases, does not wait. Does not wait. She goes after what she wants. Because there's so many impediments, so many constraints, but you've got to figure it out. Yeah. That's the woman in business. And I also think as women, we are so creative. We innovate. It's within our nature. It's within our instinct. You're always trying to find a solution. What works? What are the alternatives? So we kind of tinker around with so many things. You, you have uh, the basics, tomatoes and onions, egg, and you want to egg, make a egg, meal. Exactly. And you figure it out. So that's same but, creativity. But does it translate... <laughs> Does that creativity, you know, having all these little, you know, the, the vegetables and you're trying to make a good meal, does it translate to the business? Does it, it does. translate to the business? It does because it's innate ability. It's just that we don't explore it. Yeah. Now, for me, the advantage I have is that being out of school allowed me to explore myself, explore the possibilities. I didn't have the confinement of a course. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the confinement of an institution. Whatever I came, could do anything. What, whatever came is what Absolutely. you what you took. So that 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 kind of exposure sh has shaped me into the person I am today. Till today. Yes. yes. Because I always ask myself, what's the worst that can happen anyway? So anyhow, that's how I get my first job, and then there was no turning back. And so uh, my first degree was in uh, family therapy. That was in 2011 when I graduated. It was a very foreign concept. People didn't understand. Mm. To this day, people to don't understand day. it very well. To this day. So I ended up into psychosocial work and, you know, counseling. And I realized after a while, I thrived more in equipping other people mm. than just sitting behind a desk and listening to so people. So how long did you do this? I did that for about uh, six years. So most of it was actually pro bono. Now, how did you come into business? So that's how I transitioned. So I, all my life, had worked in the NGO space. And the last organization where I worked, I worked there uh, five years, close to six, and I really loved it. Work with children, I was so grounded in my work, I lost track of so many things that were happening. But as opportunities began to come up for me to, you know, go like up the career ladder, as you would say, I began to see certain gaps, things that just didn't settle in well with me, and I began to question a couple of things. And that's what made me realize, you know what, I want to be in a space where I can question, where I can thrive, but also where I know that when I go back to sleep, I know that I lived my word. If I said I was going to train someone, I trained them. It wasn't one thing on paper and another thing in practice. Okay. Chusa, when did you start Chusa? So I quit uh, from employment uh, 2012, by end. And then 2013, I get a scholarship. I go to India. I do a course in social entrepreneurship. So I was in India for about eight months, and the only question I had to answer is how do I want to make the world a better place? Do you know, it's so funny. I've had so many people ask me, who is, what is social entrepreneurship? <laughs> who is the social entrepreneur? The concept is wild. Mm -hmm. It's all over. Yes. But however, it doesn't seem to find its niche exactly in Uganda. Mm -hmm. I think because people tr struggle to make an impact and also, you know, have mm -hmm. the, the profits come in. So even when you started Chusa, were you categorically sure that that is the path you wanted to take to make an impact and also make profit? What was it exactly? I was more sure about the impact. About the impact. Not the profit. Be remember, I'd, I'd worked for about close to eight years in yes, the, in the uh, NGO non world. space. Yeah, so for me, I knew about social impact. That's what uh, my heart beat for, you know, just seeing young people. Because remember, I'd gone through the experience. So working with vulnerable young people, 
always touched my heart i'm like i want to do more and then just realizing i'd pick myself up and just wanting to more like relieve the moment with so many other people and say you can do it yeah, you can yeah. pick up from anywhere and yeah. be everything that you want to be there, there's, so, there's something that says i think it's somewhere you strengthen others with the same strength mm -hmm. with which you've been strengthened yes yes absolutely okay <laughs> okay <laughs> let's because, let's because we lead people where we have been mm. it's hard to take people where you haven't where, been where exactly where you have been. yes so for me, it was an impact. And typically, I wanted to work with out-of-school youth. I wanted to work with low-income communities, typically urban so slums. So why, 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 why didn't you start an NGO? Why did you start a business? So I started an NGO because uh, that's what my heart beat for. So when I was in India, one of the things I discovered is the whole concept of purpose. Yeah. What, what are you here for? At the end of your life, what do you want to be remembered for? Mm -hmm. And for me, my legacy resonated more with people changing lives. Impact. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it took me back to where I started. That little girl, yes. I wanted to be Relevant. someone that's going to yeah, be significant in life. I just didn't want to go through life. I just didn't want to make a living. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how at that time. But I knew that I just didn't want to live a basic life. So uh, when I started Chusa, for me, that was it. But also having gone through my experience, found my way. I, I, I kind of felt like, you know, you want to stand on the mountaintop and tell everyone, guys, mm -hmm. You can I, drop I, out all you want to drop out. You can still find your path. I did <laughs> it, and I did it, and so can you. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. Uh, I think one of the World Bank uh, policy policy papers, I think, released in twenty November twenty twenty one, mm -hmm. said Uganda in Africa is linked fast. Yes, is the most enterprising. Yes. yes, with the most enterprising women at thirty eight point two percent. True. Right. Yes. However. I also had another conversation with someone else, yes, because there's so much potential mm -hmm. in business mm -hmm. for Ugandan women. But how do they start? Is it out of, uh, is it out of, uh, let me just try, yes? Is it out of my neighbor studied something so I can also do it, yes? Mm -hmm. I know you have met at so many and so many have gone through your hands, okay? Business mm -hmm. development, the coaching. Mm -hmm. Is it because I need to make an extra money, uh, extra, some extra money? Yes. What is it? What is it that forces the woman to actually start? Your story is unique. It's different. It could actually relate to many women. I know. Many women, especially the women that we work with, because we work with low-income women, so women that are running micro and small businesses, mm. really, that's a group of women that we work with. And typically, most of them start for two reasons. Either they are passionate about it, especially the creatives yeah. i love art i love yeah. drawing i love you know the, i love tinkering with these things so okay maybe i could make money out of it mm -hmm. two it could be out of necessity mm -hmm. i have I a child i'm a teenage mother and i need to make ends meet you know uh, my husband left me and i need to make ends meet so those are the most common trends either passion or necessity is driving them and that essentially has also shaped the way women are showing up in the marketplace yeah because of what drives us men do yes. take the risks they yes. set out to make money it's yes. very clear mm -hmm. that's why when you look at the statistics for non-profits yes. very rare very rare. The, the percentage of men that start non-profits is very low compared to women how they shape up the marketplace yes how they're showing up and how they're showing up is this so important yes because if we're talking about building even grounds, if we're talking about women becoming a force in the marketplace, then we actually need to change the way we are showing up. Because uh, definitely when you look at the Ugandan economy, we are predominantly driven by the informal sector. When you talk about the informal sector, that's predominantly women, women-led business, women and youth-led businesses. Of course, we're a young country. So when you talk about youth, it's really like the majority. So those are the people that are running the informal sector. In the urban... In rural, the urban, yes. rural. This, the whole collection of talk about vendor businesses, talk about micro businesses, talk about small businesses, it's predominantly women, mm -hmm. whether in the urban centers or in the rural communities. Yeah. Now, the challenge with that is that we have investors coming through mm -hmm. and the woman is not ready. And, and many investor platforms will tell you they have a low representation for women. And that's why many projects are beginning to push for 70% women inclusion. Mm -hmm. yes. But even with that, many still struggle to get the kind of woman they want in those programs. Yeah. And, and the kind of woman is one that is financially literate, one that is uh, confident, yes, empowered, yes, quote-unquote yes. empowered, 
right? Yep. But also financial literacy is, is really very, is, is, is very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, also there is quite, whereas they're also looking at, I believe, the collectives, grassroots collectives, there's quite a lot also of uh, registration, the formalness, the yes. formality yes. of the organizations. Mm -hmm. Is that the woman they're talking about that they're looking for? So the kind of woman they are looking for, uh, I'm trying to avoid the, a word because yeah. then it will point to a particular program. So I'm, I'm trying to tread carefully here. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, you're looking to a woman that is established, that is not literally your grassroots kind of woman. Mm -hmm. And that is a very small percentage. Because even in the business space, when you do consulting, in Uganda we have very, very few consulting. large enterprises. So even medium, there are few. We have a lot more small and growing businesses. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. So medium is very few, large is like minute. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about the woman that is predominantly at the grassroots and you want them to get into medium enterprises. That's going to take a while. And then unfortunately for most of these programs, they're not willing to handhold the woman. Mm -hmm. Things are beginning to change. Mm -hmm. But when you come up and say, oh, we want this kind of woman and we have money to invest in them, you didn't prepare them because there are so many things that are working against a woman. Mm -hmm. In the Ugandan setting, but yes. also elsewhere. I think elsewhere. If, uh, some of these things are global, really. Because when a woman, when, when a woman and a man start a business, there are many things. If I'm a woman and, and I'm starting the same business with a man, I have, if I have a family or I have children... You're going to have to split your interests yes. and your time and everything. There's all these things. I am expected to go for the parents' meeting at school. I am expected to drop the child. I'm expected to pick the child. I'm expected to be the one to take the sick leave when the child is unwell. I'm expected to do all these other things. Yeah alongside being competitive in my business. We, we, had, we had an earlier conversation, right? We had an earlier conversation, and we were talking about this very aspect, the social aspect. What is it about, why is the woman confined? Why is she, why, why is she forced to present, you know, to present that appearance of strength? <laughs> and yet most of them are crumbling, because when you have the family, when you have children, Things change. Things change. Yeah. There are pressures as a woman in business. There are pressures. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the people expect you to be perfect. Yes, to get there on time, mm -hmm. walk up to 2, 2 a.m., crack that deal. Yes, count your monies, go back, be the perfect mother at home. So, and, and most of the women are finding that balance a little bit hard. Very, actually, very many. They don't talk about it, but they find it very hard, right? And yet they don't, most of the women in business don't actually come out and say, I'm struggling with this. Have you had anything like that? Yes. So, uh, a lot of my work, I've worked in male predominant spaces, where normally the only woman on the team and all that. And they expect you to show up. They do. And the truth is, in my earlier career years, I, I tried to be... The perfect Act one. like a man. <laughs> Think yes, like a man. Yes, yes. Show up more macho. Show and, up and, and all the movies front that. <laughs> yeah. All the movies. Like level up, basically. It's what, what everybody's telling you. Level up if you're going to be part of this team, you know. And then I realized it's exhausting. Because after a while, I'm running against myself. I'm a woman. You're and there's woman. no mistake about me being a woman. You're a woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're a woman. So one of the things I, I, I appreciated. But, but when we say you're a woman, it doesn't mean in a derogatory way. You know, no, no, like no, no, you're no. less. But for, for many people, because it, it of the does. way a woman is being branded, exactly. yes, you the don't show yeah. constructions. Yes. And it's culture. And culture is deep. So talking about that, we're going to get into a break and we'll be shortly back. <laughs> Smart 21.